Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Chase Jarvis. Welcome to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show. We're here. We're on Creative Live. This is a show where I sit down with the most awesome people, uh, and my goal is to unpack their brains with the goal of helping you live your dreams in career, in hobby, and in life. My guest today is the founder of Together Rising and Momastery. I said it. Yeah, you I got did it right. It. You did it. Nailed it. <laughs> um, she's an activist and the number one New York Times best-selling author. We're going to have an hour-plus conversation. Um, Love Warrior is the book that changed my relationship with you. I have a huge joy in welcoming you to the show, Glennon Doyle. Thank you. We made it happen. Me here. Yeah, thank like you, thank you, thank hug, you. The audience goes crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Abby's over there, audience of one. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, thank you. Ah, um, <laughs> well, it's been a long time coming. I've been watching your work for, for some time, and your story, um, I follow you closely, read everything that you put out. And mm. so, A, welcome to the show. B, um, holy smokes, what a career trajectory in mm. the last, like, I don't know, a couple years. Just wow. It's been a bit of a doozy. It's been a doozy. It's right? been a doozy, yeah. Um, we were joking before the camera started rolling about Momastery. Mm hmm. And it's the, the equivalent of like reading a book, not really knowing how to pronounce the character's name, just assigning a name to it. I called it Momastery. You called it Mom Mastery. Mom Mastery. Which because is. Because Mastery of Mom. Which is like nails on a chalkboard to me because yeah, it's the one I, thing I say I don't know anything about parenting, so I'm it. not mastering the mom in any I way. I get it, but you yeah. can see if you were like, I'm not, you Completely. know. Completely, yeah, so. yeah. Maybe it's a good lesson to pick a word. If you're gonna have a brand, <laughs> maybe pick a word that people can say, you know, that makes sense. That's the, of a good tip. Fair. Um, that's how I became acquainted with you and your work. Um, but take us through a, a little bit of the, the backstory. I knew you just um, had an amazing performance here at uh, Paramount Theater in Seattle. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, and, but give us a little overview of, A, the backstory, what you feel like a couple of key turning moments where, you, you know, the, before we go too deep, the folks who are listening, you, you know, they're creators, entrepreneurs, people trying to find their way in the world. Um, and you have so much knowledge to share, so let's just start hearing from you. Give me a backstory. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I started writing as a way to survive, to stay. I got sober when I was 25. Mm -hmm. um, I'd been an addict for 15 years. And um, I got sober because I was pregnant. So I had this Insta family right away. I got sober, and then I got married, and then I had three kids, bam, bam, bam. Um, and, you know, everyone wanted me to get sober for so long, but I think what you find out when you get sober is that life is just really hard. Like, you yeah. kind of remember why you started drinking <laughs> in the first place. Mm, at, at 12 Right, 13, like they told right? me this yeah. would be awesome, but yeah. it's actually really hard. Um, so I, one of the things that kept me uh, sane and sober was recovery meetings at that time. Yeah. And I'd go to these recovery meetings and sit in these circles with these people, and it was just like, uh, life to me because it was they were so honest yeah and I felt like I couldn't find that kind of honesty anywhere else in the real world like yeah. in the real world I had to like how are uh, you I'm fine, fine. Awesome. <laughs> love parenthood it's like so family love, love playing up, playing up marriage throw up from yeah <laughs> woo jazz hands to all the things and life is so easy and great and then like once a week I'd be able to go to these meetings where people would like just be real yeah. you know and so I thought you know why can't we do that in real life yeah. Like, why do we have to just wait for these little basements in hiding to, to be honest and real? So I just thought, I'm going to start writing. The, what I get to say in those meetings, I'm going to just, like, put on paper. Um, and so I remember the first time sitting down, a guy started getting up at, I don't know, some kind of 4.30 in the morning. Because I was still dripping with babies. Yeah. And, and, you know, I had to find time when they were all asleep. I think this is a huge thing for people at home. Like, there's a barrier, right? Like, I have three kids, I got a mortgage, I got all this stuff. You yeah. get up at 4.30 in the morning to find your time. Yeah, because I remember thinking, um, you know, the Virginia Woolf thing, like, every woman needs a room of her own. I was living in a very small apartment. I, we had no rooms, so I actually worked in the closet. Wow. But I, w I knew that I needed an hour of my own, you know, that nobody it was it had to be dark it had to be everyone else had to be asleep because I think with women when our people start waking up 
we change from who we are to like these roles, yeah. you know? Like I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a whatever. But so for this hour in the morning before anybody woke up, I could just like be me. You know, it was all like soul mm -hmm. instead of roles. Yep. Um, so and I remember the first time writing um, some like words on a paper and looking at it and thinking, oh, that's me. Like, this feels more like looking into a mirror yeah. than actually l looking into a mirror. How did it feel that you had to discover you in a closet at four in the morning? Did it feel safe or was it, was it hard? Like, did well, you, was because there any of my shame life's of, like, tra trajectory that? since then, it's yeah. kind of hilarious. Like, I've actually been able to come out of the closet right. in many ways since then. <laughs> Um, but I don't know. I mean, I remember thinking there was something important about being in the closet writing because it felt so hidden. I was able to say things that maybe I wouldn't have if, if I was in a room full yep. of light. I mean, yep. that's how my work resonated with people because I was saying things that other people didn't feel like they were allowed to say yeah. but felt. Yep. Um, and I also remember I was uh, married. Uh, I was married to my ex-husband back then, and I was in a closet. And there was, he would be still asleep. And so there was a barrier to anyone who would have come in. Like my children could not get to me uh -huh. in there. Nobody could get to me. There was no phone. Yeah. There was no internet. There was no um, possibility of being interrupted. Mm -hmm. And so it felt like sacred time. And also I can only do creative work in the morning. I don't know why. That's a really common theme. Yeah. Yeah, I've, you know, I've probably had 150 people on the couch and like people, there are people who do great work really late. Mm -hmm. There are people who do great work early. There are some people who are really militant and like, I sit down on my computer at nine, then I get up at five, mm -hmm. but way more polar to the morning, a little bit less in the evening, but you, I, I think that's really common. And I think it's, did you discover that about yourself at first because it was the only way that you could find time? Yeah. Or, yes. and then have you tried to do it other places since and it doesn't feel right and you go back to the morning? Well, I can't. Like, I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can do business. Like, mm -hmm. when, you know, after the kids get off to school, I can do business. I can yep. do I can do an interview. Sure. I can do um, work. But I can't do anything creative. And I actually don't know anything after. Like, I know yeah. all the things in the morning. <laughs> yeah. I'm so wise yeah. for, like, an hour and a half. And it's just all gone. So I just have to, like, um, grab that time. And if I do that every day, and also... For me, creating and writing is, is I mean, I, I would hope my kids wouldn't see this part, but it's like the most important thing to me. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like, I like them also, yes. but I. You're nice, I like you, you yeah, and you. Yeah, I mean, I created good. them also, yes. so I feel good about them. Yeah, that's creativity. But for me to feel fulfilled, like I've done my work for the day, I have to do that in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. And then I don't care what happens after that. Yeah. Like I've done all all the hardest things, the most important things before anybody wakes up, so the rest of the day is like gravy. But it's like it's like putting your oxygen mask on before assisting other passengers, mm -hmm. right? You got to take care of you because if you're not your best self, then, then Completely. you're giving half of yourself to somebody else. And if I don't do that time, I get nasty yeah. and edgy and all my people know. Like, why don't you go write some things <laughs> and come all back people, to us I another time? Yeah. I'll see you after you're done writing. Yeah. Okay, so you started writing literally in the closet. Yeah. And you discovered that this is, as you said, this is me on the page here. Mm -hmm. Keep unfold the story for yeah. The so so then I actually started. Set, I would wake up every morning and write all of my feelings and thoughts and ideas, and then I would send them to my like five friends. And these poor five friends. I mean, and then I would just sit at my computer and wait to see what they thought about me and my thoughts and feelings. And if they didn't write back right away, I would ping them. Like, so did you get a chance to read my thoughts and feelings for the day? Finally, one of my friends sent me a tutorial about how to start a blog. Because she was like, see, honey, if you do this, then we don't have to read your crap every day. So, at, at the same time. Right. Wait for you to right. So maybe you could start a blog. So, um, so I did. I started a blog. I named it Momastery because I felt like at that time, motherhood was kind of my main spiritual practice. That's mm -hmm. what I was learning the most from about life. And um, I just started writing on the blog every single day. And my rule was that I was getting up at still 4.30. Mm -hmm. I would, the whole world would wake up at 6, so I had to publish by 6. And I promised myself I'd publish every day, which I think was a key for me because it kept me from any kind of perfectionism. Like if it wasn't yeah. good, I still had to do it. Creativity is a habit, not a skill. Yeah. And then, and then it kept me from obsessing, like, is that good enough? Is that good enough? Is that good enough? And then the other thing that making yourself, I wouldn't do that now. I would not do that now. But, like, 
making yourself publish what you do each day keeps you from perfectionism. Um, and it also, the interesting thing was the things that people resonated the most with were often not the ones I thought they would have. Things I would have scrapped yeah. if I thought too much about it. You know? That's a, is a really important message embedded in there for sure. Yeah. I want to go back to something you just said. You said, I wouldn't do that now. Why? Do you feel like it's because you have your voice and you're practiced and you want to be more careful, more thoughtful? Or is it you just like the thought of publishing every day is overwhelming now? Or what, what was the. Well, the... that also, <laughs> I, I feel a little bit differently about my writing right now than I did back then. I wrote, my children were very little. I was writing a lot about family life and relationships. Uh -huh. I felt like <clears throat> my kids were super little, so I just felt like they didn't have any rights. You know, like I just didn't care what they, like they were, they were just meh, yeah. I just need, I just was, a, you, you can say whatever the hell you want to say about a two year old. <laughs> They're all the same, you know. They, so um, I would just throw them under the bus constantly. Um, but, and also I, I wrote a lot about my marriage. Um, in ways that like really helped people and I think were important and I don't think I'd go back and change. But now that I look back, I can see that it was probably very hard to be married to me because, um, well for many reasons, <laughs> one being that I think it would be hard to be living with someone who you know is always... Writing about your exchanges and yeah. Yeah, and I always tried to do it in a respectful way, um, but you know, there's just some things that when you give them away to everybody, you just don't keep them. Mm -hmm. You let them out of the house and they're not yours anymore. Yeah. And I wouldn't want to, to be living with someone who was constantly looking at what I did and being like, how does this apply to everyone? How is this individual experience a universal for yeah. all people? Like, yeah. So that's what I mean, okay, is that I'm more careful helpful. about writing things. Is it fair to say that the phase that you were in, though, was critical to your development? Absolutely, I wouldn't change any of it. And my, I'm not in that marriage anymore, yeah. and I needed to not be in that marriage anymore. So like, and we are still very close friends and raising a family together, but I think it's important to look back and say, how would I do things differently now? Oh, that's courageous. But I absolutely needed to do all of that, yeah. So you start, you're writing, then you get the blog. Yeah. And your friends are like, thank you. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> now we've got some other Less people alone. who can read. Right, right, um, we can shoulder the load here. But again, as we're unfolding this, what I love is it's it's very, it's linear. It's step by step. You mm -hmm. get up, you start writing for yourself, and then you start writing for an audience of five, and then you start writing for, you know, yeah, presumably and, a large, larger audience. And it's so funny because I think because my career has gotten a little more visible in the last two years, people are always like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like how this like overnight success thing. So I started this blog, what, like 10 and a half years ago, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, the, literally the 10 year overnight success, right? right? Exactly, <laughs> 10 and a half years ago. <laughs> Um, and I wrote every single day for two years before anybody did, said anything to me about anything other than my friends, mm -hmm. right? Um, and one day I wrote this post, it was called Don't Carpe Diem, and again, it is a post I would have scrapped. I thought, I didn't think it was good. My dad called me after my dad was my main reader, okay? <laughs> Love it, yes. Uh, most of my feedback is, still is from my dad. He called me and he was like, he went, eh, about the today's essay. Eh. This freaking essay went completely viral and... More than a million shares. Right, right. and Something it was like, like this teeny little blog and then you know two weeks later I was my inbox was full of um, letters from agents in New York and two weeks after that I was in New York City at an auction for a book based on the blog but, the, but I had never ever one time promoted or tried to do anything. To get, all I did was sit my butt down and write my heart out each yeah. day for the small audience that was there. And it just organically turned into the book and all the wider things. And that's how the nonprofit started too. So I, I think that's incredible, first of all. Second of all, it's I want to see what, what do you feel because I advocate that you can't just actually put stuff out there that you have to be a part of a community. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could say that you had a, you started your own community. So in that in those ways you were a part of something. Um, I'm curious to see if ch check my work here. Do you feel like more people should just focus on the craft and let things take care of themselves, or are you an, an advocate of? You have to do both sides of the coin and you have to write your stuff or do whatever your craft is and 
you know, try and get it out there. You're one of the only examples that I know, but so that's what makes me want to ask the question, like where do you sit on the spectrum of, of well, I mean, I would say and both the whole time. I mean, I think in order to be creative, there's something very, very individual about it. Yeah. Like every single person, whether you're on a team or not, if you're not bringing forth that thing that only you can bring forth, mm -hmm. um, that's crucial. But I have never done it. I mean, I, I think that most people would say I'm more community creative yeah. than anybody. Like I, to the point where now, I, I take very seriously my community's feedback, like to a probably a detriment. Like, I, I mean, Abby's laughing because <laughs> last night after the show, we did the show last night for in Seattle for thousands of people and we were walking down the street and um, some lady said, great show, Glennon. And Abby goes, if you need anything different next time, just tell Glennon on Instagram. Because, I, because my community is amazing and yeah. they give like serious feedback and I take it very yeah. seriously. Also, I mean, I've never done everything that I do in terms of writing or creating is also includes my sister and my um, Allison, who's my, um, I don't know what she is, my creative partner, my, I mean, there's nothing that I do that isn't a team effort. And with the, with the nonprofit, I mean, yep. we have 10 or 12 women who just work their hearts out on that. And to the point where we were at this big dinner the other night for Together Rising, and somebody said, oh, we were all give it, getting up to give toasts, right? And we figured out that none of us knew who the boss was. So my sister stood up and said something about me being the boss. But I, I've never thought of, I think my sister's the boss. And she tells me what to do, and then I just do it. She thinks I'm the boss. Liz, who runs our nonprofit, we all kind of think she's the boss. And I thought, is this chaos? Like, we're running a very large nonprofit here. But I actually think it's not chaos. It's just a kind of a very female way to do leadership, right? There's no hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. It's all just like this big yeah. give and take, and everybody trusts everybody. Um, so, like I always say, just hire people that are smarter than you and leave them the hell alone. Yeah, so true. <laughs> you know, so true. We're sitting in this place <laughs> like I wouldn't have, it wouldn't exist without people way smarter than me. I get it. I totally right. get it. So I think it's both. You have to have something that individual, I mean, every single person at a meeting or at a room has something inside of them that if they don't offer, that only they can offer. Um, and, then there, and then nothing will be as beautiful or true as it could be if that's not all like melded together. Talk to me about and both. That's a thing for you. Oh my God. I, it's the only way I know. Describe it though, describe it. Um, well, I think I figured out this idea of and both when I got sober because I was a super sensitive kid. Still, I'm still a super sensitive kid. And I think I figured out really early on that life was just brutal. You know, that like love and pain and risk and even just walking, in, even putting myself into a room felt so terrifying and so scary. Like, how do we do this? Yeah. Life is so scary, just showing yourself in places and saying, here I am, I hope you like me. Terrifying. Um, and so the great thing about life is, and the horrible thing about life is it gives you these ways to just drop out, right? So for me, yeah. food, addiction, booze, it just morphed into all of these ways of just, it's a hi addiction is just a hiding place. Yeah. You know, where sensitive people can go to kind of like shield ourselves from risk and pain and love, unfortunately. Um, and so 15 years after I fell into addiction, I'm 25 years old, I find myself just so hungover, sitting on a bathroom floor holding a positive pregnancy test. And I, I think I realized in that moment, I really felt like in that moment it may, I think we addicts have this time where we think, oh, this could be my last chance. Something happens where it's just, you have a knowing that like, this might be my last chance to show up. This is the life. time to flip the bit. Yeah. Right, either, either I say yes to this or it's done, you know? Um, Cause I was so sick. And, and, and something about that moment I figured out, oh, okay. So if I'm gonna say yes to this invitation to be a mother, if I want something this beautiful, then I'm gonna have to freaking show up for all the brutal yeah. Like, oh my God, I get it here on the bathroom floor. Like, I can't numb out all the brutal and hard parts of life and also have anything beautiful. Right? So it's either and both or, ne or neither. Um, so, like, I learned at a very visceral level. Sitting on the bathroom floor. Yeah. 
like this concept that I actually learned later is like science or something. I don't know. This is why I love <laughs> Brene. I'm like, I feel like this is true. Yeah. And she's like, here's the research. It's yeah. actually true, right? So um, I say we're both shame um, researchers. It's just that my work is like all out in the field. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that was my first and both. Like life is, e it, 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 you can either have nothingness mm -hmm. or you can have the brutal and the beautiful, right? Brutal yeah. is what we call it in my community. Everything's and both, right? Like my kids, it's first day of school um, and somebody, my mom said, are you nervous or are you excited? And, and my little one, nine year old goes, I'm skited. Like that's what we yeah. all are, we're scared yeah. and excited. Yeah. Like everything is and both, you know? So beautiful. When I first was acquainted with that in your work, I was like, so smart. I didn't know that you actually came up with that on the bathroom floor, which is even more powerful and memorable. Um, but I think that's a, we have a very black and white, or a world that tends mm -hmm. to black and white and there's not too many things that are. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we're gonna keep going, unpacking the journey, which has been um, I don't know. So you're now uh, writing. Mm -hmm. You got a book deal. Mm -hmm. Not on the bathroom floor. Mm -hmm. Where where does it go from here? Yeah. So so the weird thing about creative life is while you're doing these things, then life keeps happening to you, right? Yeah. So um, so I write I write the book. Um, I think a week before I go out on the road. This is, so they, they didn't know what the hell I was. It's hard to describe what I did. So they decided to call me a relationships expert. I, I don't know if, yeah. if the Today Show says that it's true or if it's yeah. on Amazon, it's true. So I was like suddenly a relationship expert, right? So then a week before I go on tour as a relationship expert for Carrie Ann Warrior, I'm in therapy. And my husband tells me that he's been unfaithful to me throughout our entire marriage. So, I'm thinking the relationship expert thing's gonna be a hard sell now. You think? <laughs> right? People are a little smarter than this, okay? Listen to me, I have all the answers. So, um, so I had to go on tour with Carrie on Warrior at that point in my life, which um, it really was just another bathroom floor moment, right? It was mm -hmm. like the rock bottom of my individual life, yep. and then here was the rock bottom of my marriage. Um, but I did it. I went on the road, and then the experience that I was happening, the thing, the thing about being a writer, because of the way that the publishing world works, you are always on the road representing a version of yourself four years ago. Yep. It is it's, so yeah, weird. Yeah, and the, just with even the, in pop culture, the lag time between you doing the work and people discovering it with you living through it, figuring it out, capturing it, whether it's in words or music or photograph or whatever, then the photograph or the, the words, they make their way around the world, you get really well known, and then people want to meet you, and you're like, that was like way back. Was like a lifetime ago, yeah. right? So this is happening now for you. Yeah, okay. so I'm writing Love Warrior uh, all during that time. But you know what, I do want to say thank God for that, yep. too. Because what I, the things I write about, and anyone who's doing anything creative is mining life, right? For the gold of it, um, and I think that the reason we can go out and talk about it is because we're not like writing from our open gaping wounds, yes. right? Things have had some time to scar over. Yeah. And the thing is that, you know, I think because of truth telling and vulnerability being like such buzzwords now, mm -hmm. that people get confused about what that is. So what they do is they think, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in a tough place and like, Brene and Glennon have promised me that if I'm just a truth teller, everything will be okay. Everything's going to be just if fine. If I just get vulnerable, <laughs> things will be fine and everyone will love me and blah, blah, blah. So they like get online and they gush out their personal story in real time. And the whole world's like, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Because that's not what it is, right? Like yeah. there's levels of truth telling. And when it's all happening to you and you're in pain, the place to tell the truth is like your very small circle. So like for me, back then it would have been a recovery group, and my therapist, and like maybe my family. Um, but when we write from our open, gaping wounds, it comes across as a cry for help. When we do it on a wide level, it does not come yeah. across as art, right? That's so you have to huge, wait. Huge, huge, huge insight right there. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to wait until your personal pain. I never write anything now until I know that this personal thing is about all of us. 
right? Like with Love Warrior, every yeah. sentence, every paragraph. Yes, this is this is my individual pain, but how does this apply to all of us? In the particular lies the universal. Universal, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, all the time. Thank God. Um, so the inter I think the most interesting part of this is that I write Love Warrior. I'm done with it. Love Warrior ends. Um, it's all about you know the infidelity and what the healing process is after that for both Craig and me, and ends with Craig and I's the suggestion of redemption. This re, is re saying your vows, right? Right, on the beach. So, this is, this book is about to be released. It's been, I already know, my whole team knows it's been chosen as an Oprah Book Club book, okay? This is gonna be a big book. This is gonna be like yep. the big whatever of, our, of my career. A lot of people's careers riding on it, a lot of, you know, the agents and the editors and Oprah's team and everybody. Marriage redemption book. But the small problem is that I am getting divorced. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and, and listen, like, way more important to me than my career is my sobriety, okay? And my sobriety is based completely on my integrity. Right? Like, that's the one thing I can't do ever is to, to live a different life on the inside that's than toxic. I am on the outside. That's toxic. Right? Yep. So I'd rather just, I mean, I remember somebody saying to me, okay, you cannot, just please, can you be a truth teller in six weeks? Yeah. Can you just, because this is a marriage redemption book. And so if they know that you're on the road and you're getting a divorce, the power is going to be lost in the book. Um, and I remember say, somebody saying to me, one of the agents saying, just please understand that you can do this, but it will be career suicide. And I actually remember think, say, thinking, okay, like I would I'm rather ready. commit career suicide than soul suicide, right? Like I can't, I've never promised any of my people that I'm gonna be like some perfect version. All I've promised is honesty, right? And if I have to live my life publicly being a version of myself three years ago. Even temporarily. Even yeah. temporarily. Yeah. No, I can't do it. It's yeah. impossible. I mean, I have zero poker face. I have zero, I, like, I would be, it would be a disaster. So, um, everybody on earth was telling me, please don't do it. Please just wait, 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 except for Oprah, who had the most writing on it, right? So just in desperation for, like, different advice, she said, the truth is going to be what, what, you, you're left with. So just start with it. Wow. So, and the thing is that when Oprah says it, everyone else is like, okay, all right, well, I, that's what I thought anyway. <laughs> so true. <laughs> they that's just a, fell like dominoes after yeah. that, you know? Like, oh, okay, maybe truth telling is a great idea. <clears throat> so the cool thing is, and I know this about my community, my readers, all they want is the truth. Mm -hmm. That's all anybody wants. Is because it that's what it's, where it started for them. That's why they started paying attention, because it was a truth and a sea of not so much truth, right? Right. And this idea of nothing's black and white. Yeah. Like, nothing. We want to see the messy humanity. middle. Humanity. Yeah. Yeah. The messy middle is yeah. where I live. It's my jam, right? It's yeah. like, we're all, there's all, everybody, they, we're out of Disney, the Disney story. Like, we're out of it. We're done. We don't yeah. need, like, the Cinderella before and the ball after. Like, we need people who are, are willing to show up in, in the messy middle. So, um, so I just announced my tour turned into, here's the divorced marriage redemption lady. <laughs> you are a very confusing person, but <laughs> tell us all the things. And so it turned out to be so beautiful because instead of this BS thing, I was all over the country having, like, real conversations about messy relationships yeah. and being true to yourself, right? And I remember saying like, I don't, I don't, all I know, I mean, it's kind of, Love Warrior's kind of a book about betrayal, but for me, it's a book about self-betrayal. Like, uh, what I learned from the Love Warrior process is that I will never betray myself, right? That when I know that something is right and true, I'm just gonna do it, no matter who else tells me not to. And, and you just gotta, as a creative person, yeah. part of creativity is having faith in your people. For sure. They can see the truth and feel the truth when they hear it and see it, and they don't need things to be perfect. You need to be able to be, or be willing to be wildly misunderstood for long periods of time. Totally. If you're, if, if you're gonna put your, your, your truth out there. Totally. Yeah. So 
the give me like tell a couple of stories if you would about the first time that so you're you you go on the morning show, mm -hmm. or whatever sh show of your choice, mm -hmm. and you drop the truth bombs. Mm -hmm. Well. I mean, there were more truth bombs to come, if you want to get... So I think we should keep... Yeah, because okay. it, it's, it's going to be even more interesting for us to look back when we know a little bit more. So keep going down yeah. your story. So, like, in the midst of all of this divorce news and the tour, <clears throat> the Love Warrior tour, I go to um, this book event, and I meet Abby at this book event. And my entire world just... Like, I realize that, um, I mean, I think the, the, the easiest way to say it is that I've, I had never understood what this freaking romantic love thing was in my whole life. Like, this is why my upset, you know, people are like always trying to figure out mm -hmm. and teach what they don't know, yeah. right? It's like, pretty, this pretty, is why yeah, my entire pretty, family yeah. is all therapists, because yeah. we're all trying to freaking figure out what the hell is wrong with our heads. So, I was a love warrior. I'd never been in love. I'd, I'd, so much of Love Warriors, like, what is this thing everyone's talking about? Trying to grapple with it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even believe people. Yeah. I didn't. I was like, this is just all Disney crap, you know? You're, you've been on the record, if I can, about sex being... So like, I didn't get it. Yeah. I didn't get it. I didn't get it all. I remember saying to people, like, what? I don't... Who invented kissing? Like, what is that? Who was like, oh, let's open our mouths? And, like, <laughs> none of it made sense to me. And I was so desperately trying to figure it out with my head, and it's just... Sex was so confusing, and I thought it was because, um, you know, I had so many body issues. I was a bulimic, and I just couldn't figure it all out. And then I met Abby, and was like, Ah, ah. <laughs> and I was the wrong plot, on that one. Plot <laughs> twist! <laughs> so, um, but listen, I need to tell you, so yep. and both. Okay, okay, here we are. So, so now I'm a divorced marriage redemption, relationship expert, love warrior, Christian, Sunday school teacher, who speaks in churches all, out of, all over the country, who is madly in love with a woman. Okay, so it's, there's a lot of and both going yeah, on here. you think. Right. M much of my audience is, um, would, would call themselves Christian. Yes. Um, there's a lot of confusion in the Christian world about... Um, I don't know. It's just a mess with what they think they're supposed to be judging. Um, so, even Oprah was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be interesting, yeah. right? It was like a trust fall. And, I, and yeah. I was like, I think they can handle it. I know they can handle it. I know it. I know my people can handle it. My, the, the day before I announced that Abby and I were in love, on social media because I had to because it was getting weird. Like I remember we were, that post. Yeah, we were having to just hide a little bit. And the second I feel like there's hiding, I just I can't. Yeah. So um, I remember one agent saying, okay, let's, let's start the bloodbath. And I wrote an essay about me and Abby. And it was so freaking beautiful. The, not the essay, the response. Bloodbath, zero. Zero bloodbath. It was, it became so interesting that one of the beauties of that day was that the focus was not even on Abby and me. The focus became, who is this community? Who is this community that is so freaking respectful and open-minded? And, yeah. um, and what I learned about that, about the creative life, is that you, I remember my friend Jen calling me and saying, because I had been an, a, 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 an advocate, a fierce advocate for gay rights for a decade, right? My kids had at that point been to more gay pride rallies than Abby had, right? This is my kids are like. <laughs> they get it. Right. Yeah. Um, and, what I, and I had been hammering that home with my audience for so long, like yeah. bringing them into, no, 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 we don't do that here, we do this here, no, we don't do that here, we do love yeah. here, we do love here. My friend Jen said, oh my God, Jen do you see, yeah, yeah, yeah. She said, do you see that you've been creating for a decade the community that you needed? Like, so you can only connect the dots looking backwards, that is just an aha, obvious, incredible thing that you've been doing. Like I thought that I was creating a net for other people, mm -hmm. 
And then I turn around and like that's the net I get to fall into. Which is why it is so important for us to create communities that are radically inclusive, right? Because you don't know what you're gonna need. You have to treat any person who's being excluded like they're a member of your own family because they probably will be eventually. Yeah, exactly. Just look at your watch. It's a matter of time. Right, right, right. Right. So, I don't know. I mean, the the beauty of that was watch. And of course, there's always, you know, the, the outliers, the trolley type people. But for the most part, I can just tell you, I will never not trust my people. How, do you feel like trust was something that you developed when you got sober? Because trust is a huge issue for people, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you've heard like the, you get burned once and then you never, you know, if you put that out there as a creator and it doesn't go well, mm -hmm. um, is it because you're not doing a good enough job being honest enough or you're in the wrong community or, you know, trust is a huge thing. So how did you develop the trust that you have with the people close to you in your community, and you got any advice for people who, like trust issues are, they're, they're things, they're real. Well, I love, I love sure. Brene's, Brene's take is pretty interesting, like there's pieces of trust that you have to go back and build, and she's got her little acronyms, like, yep. like bravery is in, in her new book, mm -hmm. but talk to me about how you think about trust, and you were just so, just now, you were so clear about your level of trust. Mm -hmm. How did you get that? Well, I'm sure there's an easier way. I mean, there's got to be that, that an expert would know about. I mean, for me, if I, if I said, well, if you want to build trust with an online community, so what you have to do is just 10 years, yeah. <laughs> pouring every bit of your love and your mind and your soul into these people, mm -hmm. reading every single thing that they say, writing back to them in real time, um, getting to know their families, create a team of women who will respond to these people's needs and actually um, pay their heating bills and help them foster children. And I mean, this is like yeah. a community that has been built on back and forth. Yeah. Um, like, I think if you want people who are going to care about you in a community, you have to just like desperately care about them, right? So that's what's happened over a decade for me. I mean, these are people who we show up all over the country, I travel around, and they show up in real life, and it feels like a family reunion. Yeah. Um, so, and, 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 and I also, like as my friend was saying last night, I, we did this, this um, first stop on this Together tour in Portland two nights, or three nights ago. Okay. And it didn't go great. Really? Yeah. Like, I won't get into the details, but I mean, I thought it went great. <laughs> And uh -huh. then uh -huh. I opened up my social media, which I have a, a love-hate relationship with social media. We can talk yeah, about that in a minute. I think we should. Okay. <clears throat> but um, some of it's beautiful, and, and people share with me in an open-hearted and kind and brave way. Yeah. And the feedback was rough. And I'm going to tell you that for 24 hours, I was, like, unreached. I was utterly devastated because I thought that I was doing this good thing, and there's a process that happens to me when I get feedback that is not trolly, mm -hmm. it's yeah. real yeah, and internalizing. good and true. Oh, yeah. um, and so what happens to me is that I want to shut down and I want to cry and pout and, and I hate everyone and I feel woefully misunderstood and I want to tap out. And maybe I do that for a little bit. And then what stays in my head is stay open. Stay open. Stay open is like my mantra because Whenever I'm at that low point and I feel misunderstood, it's because something amazing is about to happen because collab creativity has to be collaborative. Yeah. And if you want to be an artist in, in community, then you have to be ready for that community to say, eh. Yeah. And it's so painful. I don't know why it's so painful for me. I mean, my friend last night said, it's because you care the most amount. <laughs> Maximum the caring. Most amount. <laughs> Maximum care. <laughs> right. So it just floors me, but there's something magical. So so anyway, I spent my team and I spent two days between Portland and Seattle, actually taking in all the feedback and yeah. recreating the whole evening. Wow. <clears throat> and it was totally different last night, and it was so much better. Will you say what you changed? Yeah, so we, basically what we did is our dream was, you know, we're all in all, all these conferences mm -hmm. where there's all these amazing activists and, and leaders, and um, I would tell you that most, a lot of the conferences I speak at, I would not be able to avoid a ticket to, or afford a afford, ticket to. Afford, yeah. It's insanity. It, yeah, yeah. Yep. Thousands expensive. of dollars yeah, yep. to get in the door. So these rooms become so 
elite and, yeah. and exclusive. And Loaded and all It's that, almost yeah. obnoxious to me. So, um, so our dream, my, my uh, co-creator in the Together Tour is Jennifer Rudolph Walsh. So she's just this amazing, probably the most famous literary agent in the world. She's, I know Jennifer okay, well. She's, she's at WME. Yeah, she's Brene and Oprah. Did and you say hi to her for me? I will, I will. Well, we were talking about you she, last night. She's going to go, no way. Really? That guy? Yeah, oh, Small really? World. Small You world. guys have it cool. Small world. Well, so she, of course, she's always in these rooms. Yep. And so our idea together became, okay, we got to find a way to like democratize wisdom, right? Like we have to find a way to get everybody into these rooms. Um, and it started last year. I had to go on tour for Love Warrior. Mm -hmm. And it was right before the election. And I felt like I hate, I hate book tours with deep burning passion because, um, because they're just like, me, 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 look at me, look yeah. at my book, look at whatever, and it's just uncomfortable. So I thought, okay, what if I could find a way to use this book tour to get people in the door and then lift up voices that wouldn't normally be heard, um, especially at a time that was so important before the election last year. So we ended up having all of these um, amazing women of color and all different types of people on the stage. And so that turned into this year, um, so anyway, the you point want, is, yeah, we're to, trying to get really cheap tickets, yep. like we wanted to be in the most beautiful theaters in the country, and we wanted to have really cheap tickets, like $25 tickets, and then we wanted to give away hundreds of tickets. So in every city we went to, we wanted to go to like, the, whatever women are most underserved in those cities, and just like give away hundreds of tickets, get all these people in the door, and have the most top-notch speakers on the stages. So in order to do that, we needed sponsors, right? Mm -hmm. Sponsors scare the bejesus out of yeah. me. I've actually never had a sponsor in my life. I've never partnered with a company. I'm terrified of it because artists, art and business, like. Yeah. It's tough. <clears throat> it's not my strength. Um, so I just always thought black and white, right? Easier just to keep these separate, just no to everything forever. Um, <clears throat> and so there was no other way to do it. We needed sponsors. If, if I wanted to give away tickets, if I wanted cheap tickets, I'd have to have sponsors. So we chose beautiful sponsors, whatever. The problem was that we didn't explain any of that. So my people who are used to Ad free. nothing, yeah, yeah. nothing, like this yeah, is yeah. the one thing they can trust it. me with, right? Yep, yeah, um, I, I went there, I get it. It's, yeah, they I, come to yeah. this event and they're like, what the fuck? Yeah, who are these, yeah, who are these people? Right. They're not your people. We're and your people. so for me, and like Abby and I, like we did this. We told our love story on stage. Like for a for a person who's who's um, always pretty vulnerable, it was like the most vulnerable I've ever been. And so to do that on stage, and then to have people be like, "You sold out." I, I just wanted to just oh, like if I could have yeah, just yeah. melted. Especially into the combination of those two things in the same place. Oh yeah, I get it. So, and to have any, like, to have any of my readers disappointed in me, like, I was trying yeah. to tell Abby, like, the only thing that could be worse, because she's like, are you going to be okay? Like, yeah. the only thing that could be worse is if I, like, was living outside of my integrity, like, in our family. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the only thing that could feel worse to me than this right now. It felt like I was outside of my integrity. Well, you've created as an extension of your family in some ways. Exactly. Yeah, I get and it. I felt I, like I, I let it. them down. But the thing is, it wasn't that we were, what I figured out over time is, no, 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 the problem is not, so you're actually not trying to screw anybody. You're, the good news is that you actually are not trying to hide anything, yep. <laughs> right? Yep. So that's good, that's a good start. The problem is not that you didn't tell them the truth, the problem is that you didn't tell them enough truth. Got it. So last night in Seattle, we started by saying. Here's why. Here's why. There are hundreds of women around you right now who would not have been here Literally, literally yep. 700 last night. Women in this room, in this, who would not have been there if it weren't for these two sponsors, and we are so grateful to them. And huge, entirely different, yeah, mo. It's just not enough. It's yeah. not that it's not the truth. It's just not enough truth. And that's yeah. a trusting people too. Yeah. Like first of all, trust that they're smart enough to get to it. know when you're selling something to them without explaining it. Yep. They don't miss anything. Yeah. And second of all, they're smart enough, if you explain it right, to understand. So anyway, we changed it all, and it went so No, that I love, I, 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 that's why I'm asking some of these questions, like explain that, because there's so many truth bombs in there about not going far enough with the truth and explaining and the creative, the business and creativity conflicts. And that's what the people who are listening and watching right now, they're all dealing with that. And they haven't had, by and large, the success that you've had. And so these things are all, going to be landmines in their future. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, whatever we can do to talk about them in the open. I mean, just like creator to creator, mm -hmm. this doesn't get talked about very much. Like the messy middle, all the, it's, um, you've heard Brene talk about gold-plated grit. Mm -hmm. Like it's, you, you talk about how hard it was for about a quarter of a second and then you get on back to your wins. And you're Cinderella yeah, at the ball. Yeah, back to the ball. Right, right, um, right. But I mean, even that this was like three days ago. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing. And I think it also comes down to just like the, the what to take in and what not to take in, mm -hmm. right? In terms of criticism, I mean, I know people who are like, screw it all. I, don't, I, can't, I can't take any of it in. Yep. I'm just gonna do my thing and, and that, I'm not sure that works. And then I know people who take it all in and that doesn't work. Yeah. So I've made up some rules for myself in terms of criticism. This is, I gotta hear these rules. <clears throat> so, and I don't know if they're the same for boys as girls. I don't know. I don't, we'll I don't know We'll compare notes. Boys. Okay, so I know for women, like I would say over the last 10 years, I could, def I could break my criticism down into four categories. So okay. like, I think of it as we put something out into the world, then we're gonna go out into the mailbox and like collect our feedback, yep. right? So if I go out into my mailbox and collect my feedback about my work, um, for sure, at least a quarter of it will be about my looks. Wow. It does not matter if I'm talking about social justice, if I'm talking about um, divorce or my, it doesn't, it doesn't, no, it doesn't matter. 25%. 25% will be you're too skinny, you're too, it used to be you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too, your hair's too blonde, your hair's not blonde enough, you have, you have too much Botox, you have no Botox, you're, I don't know, it's like a, a, a way of um, silencing women to talk about their looks, and it, or you're pretty too, I mean, it doesn't, it's not that it has to be negative, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's just, just as obnoxious yeah. when it's positive, it's yeah. like, Anything that has to, anything to do with looks for me is yeah. like junk mail. Like I do not even take it into my house, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't take the good, I don't take the bad, I don't take it in anymore. I used to. I used yeah. to like change my whole self yep. based on what anybody said about me. So anything about my parents, clothes, out the door. Then the second thing that happens to women is that no matter what you're talking about, they go to your relationships. Because women are very relational. Yep. So one way to silence women is like. Attack the thing that they, yep, I get You're it. a bad mom. You're a bad, like the first question I always get. So how are you doing all of this? Like where, where are the kids? Like, well see the thing is that kids, children generally sometimes have two parents, Yeah. right? <laughs> so like often when they're not with me, they're with the other one or that's just, you know, how a lot of families work. So, and, and that's not something that, but that's like the microaggression yeah. of like, let's not talk about your work. Let's talk about like whether your, you even have a right to do this work. Yeah. Are, are, you, are, are, you, are you mom enough? Are you mom? Are your relationships in order? Right? Are you, first, are you attractive enough to be talking? Are your relationships perf enough, perfect enough to be talking? Right? So I, I do see that often when men, when, when, art, when artists who are men or activists who are men or leaders who are men share, um, the feedback is about what they're sharing. Often women, the feedback is about whether they have a right to be sharing in the, the first place. The context of their sharing. Yeah. Right. Like, let's get these things so in order before up. we hear what she's saying. I mean, it's, I think most women, if you're going to use your voice in the world, this is what happens. And it's easier when you know what's going to come. I'm so excited for the rise of the feminine energy in our mm, culture that's happening. It's so good. And that, I think it's fair to say there's a long way to go. Mm -hmm. But just even that you're able to identify those things as blockers and so again, thank you for sharing. But yeah. I, don't, I, I feel like I hijacked that just for a second because no, I wanted to squeeze that absolutely. in there. So if 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 twenty five percent of the feedback is looks, twenty five percent is uh, analyzing the quality of your relationships before we'll hear what you have to say. What, what's the other fifty percent? Well, okay. So another twenty five percent is like personality wise. Okay. Like oh my god, I can't stand her voice, like her actual voice, <laughs> which I can't stand my voice either. I get it. What? But like I mean, it's a little Minnie Mouse ish. But um, I'm always trying to like go a little lower, like like I just try to start lower. But then I always end up back up here anyway. So, um, so voice, person, you're too much, you're too sensitive, you're too whatever. Anything related to my personality or things I can't change has nothing to do with my work, right? But then there's this 25% that's actually about my work, okay? So it's it's hard stuff. It's like. You know, I, I talk about, say something about race. Mm -hmm. And somebody says, that's you. You missed wow. that one. Yeah, you, you said the wrong really thing. You really missed that. Yeah. Yeah. 
or it's the what just happened on stage, like mm -hmm. that didn't feel good, like that was off, uh -huh. or it's like it's it's actual criticism about my ideas and my work, and that's the good stuff. Yeah. Right. So you have to be like smart enough to disregard the first seventy-five percent, mm -hmm. but if you're not brave enough to take the good stuff, to take that twenty-five into your house yep. and open it and wrestle with it, like that's the, and it makes you feel bad and pouty and like. Especially when it's about race, it just crushes me because I'm like, I'm a very fragile white person, right? I've got all that white fragility going. So it's like wrestling with that and staying, trying to do better the next time instead of letting it take me out yeah. of the game. I think the best activists and artists I know are the people who take that 25% in and allow it to, to make them better. It's so true. So that, was, that takes us up from writing in a closet mm -hmm. to last night. Yeah. A, congratulations. Thanks. B, can we unpack a couple of other little, um, little small things you've created, like, um, oh, this nonprofit. You've referenced it several times. Uh, you've given more than seven million bucks by my last count mm -hmm. to people in need. Mm -hmm. Holy crap! Where this, where this come out of? Is it just like a thing? Like no. So and I'm, oh, I'm also doing this. Like, but it was never like that. It was it was everything happens just because of this community that I have. And then I'm just always just responding to what they want and then it turns into something. So so there's this one day where actually what had happened is I had shown the book cover to Carry On Love Warrior. Warrior. No, it was oh, actually way on. long ago. Okay, yeah. Got it. So the first one I had showed it on uh, to my my community and something amazing happened. Like they all scooped them all up and like went to really high on the Amazon list and all the agents were calling like, what the hell just happened? I'm like, I don't know, I just showed it to him. Yeah. So I just feel like so grateful to my community and so I always feel like gratitude is, is an energy that you have to do something with. Like, you don't just feel it. I feel like feelings are like fuel, you know, like you just do something with them and that's one of my sanity, sobriety strategies. Like burn it up, you know. Um, so I thought, okay, with this gratitude, I'm gonna open my email and I'm just going to respond to the first one. I'm going to do whatever the first person asks me to do because people always ask me to do stuff. This is actively you're saying this to yourself. I'm going to do whatever. This yeah, I just talk to myself all day. That's what <laughs> I so I call it talking to God. Abby calls it talking to myself. <laughs> whatever. Okay. So um, I'm like talking to my best self. You know, you've got like oh, yeah. these two selves, the self that wants to just watch Netflix all yep. day. And then there's like yep. this higher self that yep. you're checking in with. You're trying to be that one. Yeah. Um, so I open my email and it's this email from this beautiful woman who is from um, where is she, Indiana and she was running a home for teenage moms. Um, uh, this, it was called PHI and she was just broken hearted. She was just writing to me broken hearted because the night before she had had this 14 year old girl come to her doorstep at this home with a baby and she had to turn her away even though they had a room because of all this red tape and funding and she just didn't, she couldn't let her in. Oh, that's a horrible feeling. And I was like, oh my God, this is so amazing. Yeah. Like, this is where I sweep in and save the day. This is what I'm gonna do. So I call this woman. She had left her phone number. So I call this woman and I'm like, listen, I I'm gonna you. give you the money you need for this girl. I, I, I've got it, I'm gonna, how much do you need? And she said, we need $87,000. And I said, well, then we need a new plan. <laughs> Yeah, that I was wrong. It's going to be a hard <laughs> credit card charge to hide from my family. So, um, but that kicked you into action. Yeah, yes. so that yeah. night, so we hung up. I was depressed. I was like, well, there's nothing I can do. But then I was like, wait a minute. Like, this all, I feel like something, this, there's I feel like thing. this is supposed yeah. to happen. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, this is so funny. Like, this is that obnoxious thing I do where I think this is about me. No, no, this is about I mean, our community. I'm going to save the day. Yeah. Right. Like, if I care about this story, I just happen to be lucky enough to be leading this community of the most caring, amazing people on earth. So what if my job, I always say like the most revolutionary thing you can do is just introduce people to each other. Yeah. My job is not to save the day here. My job is to introduce Sarah and this 14 year old girl to my community in the most beautiful way I know how, because this I'm a storyteller. Prose. Yes, you are. So I just tell the story and then just see what happens, right? So. Sarah and I got on the phone and stayed up forever just trying to write this the most beautiful thing we could write about her home, this home and this girl. And we decided we were going to ask them to see if they could fund this um, $87,000 that we needed for this girl. And I actually think it was, I don't know what it was. It, was, it may have been less than that. 
um, because I said to Sarah, if we raise that money, will you go get this girl tomorrow? Because I couldn't, like, she was, we didn't know where she was. Yeah. Will you find her? Will you, like, send cars and find this yeah. girl and get her and her? She said, if you can raise that freaking money, but we promise we'll get her. So, told the story, called it a love flash mob because at the time I was obsessed. Do you remember the love flash mobs yeah. where, like, one person starts dancing? Yes. I feel like it's the best, like, image for what we all want to do, right? Uh -huh. We're just all like walking around, disconnected from each other, like zombies, and then one person starts dancing and we're like, oh my God! And, her, and it's actually the second person. The second like, person! Yeah, the second person Who is the one. follows the like, first fool. Cause, yeah, because there's someone who's got to be, you may be a little bit off their rocker, that's the, the cultural norm, right? And then it's the second person who's like, I'm down with this. And it's then it's exactly like, what I want to do. Two is a gang. Right, so let's join the gang. Right, yeah. and everyone's like, that's cooler than what we're doing over here. Yep. Like, they look weird and stupid, but it looks like fun. Yeah, you've seen that there. YouTube video, the guy dancing at the concert, for sure. Well, and the <laughs> Oprah Black Eyed Peas one. So yeah. that one, the Black Eyed Peas ones, has like 8 million views, and I'm for sure 7 million. <laughs> like, I'd, Dave, just, oh my God, this, is, this is humanity. We want to do this. This is what we want to yeah. do. So I called a love flash mob because I thought, this is what I want. Like, one... I'm the idiot who's going to start dancing mm -hmm. here, and then somebody's going to do it. Yep. Somebody is going to love be this, and then it's going to be dominoes, trust. right? Yeah. Yep. So we opened up. I said, oh, and the important thing, I think the magic of the Love Flash Mob was that we decided that nobody was allowed to give more than $25. That's totally remarkable. Yeah, because I felt like, okay, my job is to, like, I know these people, I trust them, they're going to have this rising of wanting to give, and what is it that breaks that? There's something that, that comes between the pressing of the giving and the wanting to give that makes people not give. And I think that's the like indecision and it's the, yep. it's the how much do I give and will it make a difference? And will and, someone see and do I need to be known for that or not known for right. that? There's, yeah, there's and do I have to cultural, check with yeah. my wife before I give? Because yeah. if it's a big number, I do. Yeah. And also, I felt like we had so many different types of people at Monastery, and some of them were wealthy, and some of them weren't. And I didn't yeah. want the people who, you know, for whom giving $17 is a big deal, yep. to feel like their contribution was less important than anyone else's. Spectacular how you figured that so, out. So I think that's why it worked. Anyway, I didn't sleep that night. Woke up the next day. We started it, and we had, I mean, it just poured in. So by two o'clock we had all the money, like $87,000. So she got to go get this little girl and her boy and bring her in. And at that point we had all the money and we're like, what do we do? So I said, Sarah, go around the house and, and ask everybody what they need. Ask all the teenagers, what do they need? What do their babies need? We're going to make the fastest Amazon list that ever happened. So put it all together. So then two days later, they spent some camera crews over to tell a story about this. And this could make, it makes me teary every time. They, there was a wraparound porch on the home, and you couldn't even see the door because the boxes were from floor oh, yes. to ceiling. The whole Amazon list was just gone within hours. And I got to go to the house and meet the girls and hold the babies. And I just felt like, oh, this is where this I is, live. Yeah. Like, this is my jam. This is my jam. Like, not because, it's so funny when people are like, it, it has nothing to do with being a good person. Nothing. It's because it's like so fun, yeah. right? So it's like joy, like I'm a joy junkie. It, like, it was just the most alive I'd ever felt. So then we just kept doing them. And, and you know, the most recent one, we come, my dear friends, uh, Cheryl Strait and, and Rob Bell and, and Elizabeth Gilbert and Brene, um, joined together when the um, refugee crisis started getting more attention. And so we did one two Christmases ago that raised... I don't know, I have to check it because Abby, God knows I'm terrible with numbers, but I think it was like three and a half million dollars in two and a half days or something with the average donation being between 20 and 30 bucks for wow. refugees. It's just, people are so good. People are good. People are so good. We don't, we don't, um, we don't see enough of how good people are, you know, but I, I was telling you before, it, it, it it doesn't surprise me that I'm doing all of this because I get so much attention for it. It's like, yay, good together job, rising, Glennon. you're yay. so good. You raised all the money, Glennon. So whatever. But what amazes me is that all of the thousands of people in their homes who read these stories and are like, I'm going to give to that, and no one's ever going to know about it. You know, they say, like, character is what you do when no one's watching. Like, yeah. these people are never going to get applause for it. I mean... 
we had this one little girl write to us. We do this thing called Holiday Hands. This one little, this mom, um, she wrote to us and said, my little girl is bullied at school. She has some differences. Her favorite thing on earth is when she gets letters um, from her grandmother. She gets like one a month and it makes her day. Do you think you could ask people to send her letters? So fast forward, this, I'm at a, um, we put it on the website. I'm at an event speaking in some state. This woman walks up and she, uh, she does the Q&A. She's shaking in front of thousands of people. And anyway, she turned out to be this little girl's mother, Gabriella's mother. They were on their 10,000th letter. They were on the Today Show because of how many freaking letters this girl has. <laughs> so every day now, she goes out to her um, her mailbox with um, what they, like the equivalent of a kid's wheelbarrow, wheelbarrow yeah. <laughs> and Red pulls wagon. in all of her mail, and she can't even open it all. She's she's she, and this mom's crying. She goes, "What I want, what I need you to know, is that my little girl opens them and then she writes." So she has become this little one who was like, you know, feeling like kind of a victim of the world has now become this little fierce advocate who writes back to lonely kids and says it's okay. She, you know, she showed me a little screenshot of some of the letters she writes back. It's going to get better. You're not alone. She's writing back to these people. So wow. besides giving money, yeah. what blows my mind about this is that 10,000 people sat in their houses. <laughs> <laughs> penned a letter. And penned a letter Put to a this stamp on it. Girl. I don't even know where stamps are in my house. Same. <laughs> no Same. idea. No, I'm, if my bill, I have to electronically yeah. do the bills because yeah, yeah. I can't write right. envelope stamps. They, they wrote letters. They, um, they put <laughs> stamps on it. They addressed the letters. I know. They it's carried bonkers. them to their mailbox. I'm thinking about all these steps too. Ten, time sends that times 10,000. Thousands and yeah. thousands of people. So I don't know. I just, I feel so passionately about just the power of these kinds of stories reminding people that, I mean, there's a lot going on in the news that makes us feel like we're so divided and so different and so hopeless. But I see really unified and hopeful goodness every day. You know, it's kind of like if whatever you're expecting is what you're, you'll find. Yeah. Like that's what I'm looking for all the time and I find it everywhere. So true. I think that's the, the mindset. What I've just in, again, knowing your work for some time and now sitting here with you, just the mindset that you have so talk to me a little bit about the way that you think about your mindset. Do you spend any time like staying, like how do you get yourself back to center? Because mm -hmm. we all go off the rails a little bit and you're back to center. And when you see something you don't like or you get sucked into the, we'll talk about social media in just a second, mm -hmm. you get sucked down that rabbit hole and you're like, wait, this isn't real life or life is right back here, it's right here in front of me. Or how, like what are some ways that you keep your mindset? Because to me it's been super clear that that's a huge part of your game. Yeah. Game is in like how you, play to win and get your message out there and stay strong and or soft. Yeah. Oh, strong stay back, strong soft. or soft. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Um, that's so interesting to me because it it's, feels like part of my job is to be strong, but part of my being in the way I am in, in the world is all yeah. because I'm so soft, right? So it's so interesting to be a highly sensitive person in a world where my job is to constantly put myself out there. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that people have really complicated answers to this. I feel like the way that I stay um, sane-ish and <laughs> Ish. it feels beautiful. it feels a little bit not true enough to just <laughs> straight up say sane. <laughs> Especially because my wife is here, so she, <laughs> she let me get away with that. She's but like raising her hand over there. Yeah, sane-ish and centered-ish. Um, are really simple and it usually has to do with like sleep yeah and food and water like we want these things to be really complicated um but usually for me they have to do with um the very very basics you know i have to get enough sleep i go to bed really early um sometimes i feel like the difference between people who can write or not we think it's complicated but it really has to do with whether that you're going to spend that extra hour on netflix or not <laughs> no, nice. it's legit. It's right. I have, I have ten things that I do, and if I do those ten, th I have zero examples of doing these ten very, very simple things that are equ equivalent of what you're talking about, like eating, you know, a certain way. I need way to know all I, yours. Can you tell me all yours? In oh case my they gosh! You know, actually, I'll pull out my phone. Yes. Is this, we're gonna go there. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, you have to hear this, Abby. 
I mean, these are the most <laughs> important things we call because there's easy buttons. I feel like easy right. buttons are what get us away from ourselves and the truth. Mm -hmm. So for me, those things are booze, food, all the things mm -hmm. that just. And then there are like reset buttons yeah. that are that, that remind me of what's true and myself. Right. Okay, this is about you, but I'm going to share this. Tell me. Okay, and I think the context is really important. I don't have any examples of doing these things, regardless of how hard or tough or whatever my day or my week or my life is at this time, where I do these things and I don't feel okay. Yes. Don't feel healthy, alive in my own skin. Um, be in bed for eight hours. Mm -hmm. It's not always sleep, but if I'm horizontal, I'm, I, I spent the first 20, 15 years of my career bragging about five mm. or four or three hours of sleep. And I thought it was like, interesting and neat. And yeah. now it's toxic as hell. <laughs> Be in bed for eight hours. I move my body mm -hmm. every day. You know, combination of weight and yoga, weight training and yoga. And sometimes it's a five mile run. Sometimes it's a run around the block. I just mm -hmm. move my body. I meditate in the morning. I meditate in the evening. I play or make something every day. Mm. And this is the equivalent of your writing. Mm -hmm. Or if I don't actually actively make, and I, I, I tell myself this is the thing that I'm making, mm -hmm. so it's not looking backwards like, uh, yeah, I made a joke. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't allow myself to You're check. You're not retroactively. Check the box. No, no, no. It's like, okay. This is the thing I'm making, or I'm gonna goof off mm -hmm. because that, that keeps my spirit light. I have a visualization and a gratitude practice mm -hmm. after my morning meditation. I review big goals, and the, this like reviewing big goals literally takes me like 20 seconds. I look at a thing on my phone. I'm like. That's what I'm focused on right now. Zero to one glasses of wine. Mm. I don't not drink, but I know if I drink like three, four glasses of wine with a great dinner, I can call it like, oh, I just had great wine. And, and every once in a while, I'll overindulge. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, like I'm on my game if I'm having zero or one. I eat clean, paleo-ish. Um, drink 64 ounces of water. Mm, the water. There you go. Isn't it? So you're, insane how simple these things are. Those are things that are available to most of us right. most days. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and there's nothing requires outside stuff. I don't need a thing to go to. I don't need a, any special equipment. I mean, I have to have the basics. I have mm -hmm. to have a roof over my head in order to feel secure, all those kinds of things. But we got on, on me, but it was about you. These are, these are, you have some subset of things. Maybe you don't track them every day, but mm -hmm. if, like t that's the key to your sane-ish, center-ish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is, is so I fair? have my things that are, I think that probably my people would say that I'm a, a, an insanely disciplined person. Mm -hmm. So I think that people think that creative people um, are woo, woo yeah. but that's what I found is the, the most creative people um, are also the most disciplined because structure yeah. liberates. Yeah, that's for sure. Right? We have to have a structure inside of which we can be wildly creative. So I'm like wildly creative from 8.30 to 10. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> like I have very, very strong loosely held opinions. <laughs> right? Like yeah. it's this and bowl yes. of, of structure. So mine are I have to, um, I have to move my body. Mm -hmm. If, and, it, and it's so weird, this mind, body, spirit thing. Like, if my body doesn't move, my mind is not going to show up for They're me. They're absolutely connected. And the science is very clear. To totally. If I have a, a mind problem, yep. if I have a, a mind challenge, a creative challenge I'm trying to figure out, it will never be figured out when I'm sitting at my computer. Mm -hmm. It will always be figured out on the freaking elliptical. If I like, get on stage in front of 5,000 people and I haven't moved my body, I perform so poorly. Same. I don't care if I'm the first person at the conference. It's 8 a.m. I will get up at six. I'll. I don't even care what it is. Like I'll move. Mm -hmm. I'll go for a run in the crappiest place in the crappiest weather. I'll hit the the gym in the bottom, the basement of the crappy Holiday Inn. Same. And it's the difference maker. Yep. Okay. So moving your body is important. Yep. Sleeping. Um, you already said. Sleeping, eating. Mm -hmm. I have to eat healthy-ish. Mm -hmm. Um, I also, food is so tricky for me because I have to eat healthy while not going overboard to where I'm eating unhealthy. It's weird for yeah. me because of my eating pa eating disorder yes. past. So food is a huge challenge for me and yeah. always will be. Like what's the balance between being healthy but not, um, kind of what you just said about wine. Mm -hmm. Like I don't tell yourself this is healthy when yeah. really you're just slipping back into your obsessive stuff. So yeah. I have to watch that carefully. Yeah. Um, and water. Water. 
I can walk. 64 ounces, that's what I'm clocking. What are you clocking? <laughs> for sure, I'm not clocking enough. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> We're never clocking All I know is that I should drink more water and that the answer is usually water for me. Like, if things are, are kind of bad in my mind, mm -hmm. a glass of water. If things are very, very bad, um, a, a bath. If things are woo, then I need to get my ass to the beach. <laughs> get in. Right, get in the in water. The water. Yeah. But it's some form of water that is usually the answer to everything for me. Um, it's often just a walk outside. Yeah. I mean, the more anxious I get is usually direct, is, I think is directly related to how oh, uh, much I'm living in the cyber world as opposed to the real world. That is a mm -hmm. big yeah. thing for me. Um, we recently, I have a 14 year old son and he is the one that I was pregnant with on the bathroom floor. So I always say like he's the one that brought me into the world <clears throat> and he's great. He's amazing and really creative. And what I've found in the last few years since we got him a phone is that he's just losing some of his self and mm. his creativity and he's living in, in this as opposed to, like our entire life is trying to get him out of the phone and back to us. Yeah. <clears throat> um, which is usually I'm like I, I'm usually on my phone like Chase get off your phone <laughs> like that thing is and his obnoxious. name is Chase right his name is Chase yeah, yeah. I've heard that. so I was going for a walk with him the other day and I I said Chase here's the deal I feel like I've made a lot of mistakes parenting you and I will continue to make mistakes parenting you but the mistakes that I make are when I try and I do my best and in retrospect it wasn't the right thing. Mm -hmm. But this phone thing, you, you, I, you know. I know it's wrong. Yeah. Like, I value creativity more than anything. Because for, for me, creativity has to do with living who you are. Like, yep. taking who you are on the inside and giving it to the world in one form or another. And I'm so afraid that what these phones are doing to these kids, and now I sound like freaking like a mile in my day, whatever. But I think it's true. Like, I, I know there's problems with social media and all of that. That's not my fear. My fear is that kids who would have become artists are not going to become artists. And kids who would have become um, naturalists are not going to become naturalists. And kids who would have become athletes are not going to become athletes. Because who you are, because you find out who you are in the quiet. Yeah. In boredom. You have to get bored before you actually, yeah, I, I totally subscribe to that. When you're sitting there yeah. and you have nothing else to do is when something rises inside of you, you're like, I want to do that. Yeah. I want to draw. And if you're always just not, you're one, one click above boredom and you don't ever go there. Never. This thing will keep you from it, yeah. You live a life of exterior instead of interiority, right? <laughs> like you don't ever have to go inside yeah. to find out who you are. Um, and so I said, Chase, I feel like this is the one thing that I'm going to look back on and say, I didn't do right by you. And I didn't. You, you, it would have been better. You would have learned more about yourself. You would have been a wholer person if I had taken that phone from you. Even though, and the reason I'm not doing it is because everybody else is doing it. Because mm -hmm. it's too hard and too weird. And 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 he said everybody else. And I said, you know what? There are things in every culture that everybody's doing that later we find out are poisonous. Like for example, a hot minute ago. Everyone on earth smoked. Right. Right. Like doctors were like, get your lucky strike or whatever. Uh -huh. And then a generation later, we learn, oh, that's killing everybody, so we should all stop. Like, I think that we're going to find out that this, you know, these teeny teenagers, there has to be a time where they are just with themselves for a hot minute yeah. to find out who they are. So the really cool thing is that my kid was like, I think that's right. Like, he knew. Yep. You know? So we, we took all of the... Um, in the internet off our phone. So they can text now, we can text, because I want them to be able to be con to connect with their Connection, friends. Yeah. There's a social thing there. But um, I'm telling you, like a week after his phone was gone, he was reading again, he was doing his little maps that he does. I felt like like some light was coming back to his, his addiction. Yeah. He was coming out of addiction, is what was happening, right? So for me, I know that when I feel start to feel really um, hopeless or anxious, that That's the not your further I can get from that world, but there's an end both there too. Yeah. I mean that internet world and social media is how all of this has happened. I get it. So you know I don't think it's a black and white for me of nothing, all or nothing. But it, there has to be 
I have to live more in the real world than I do in the in the cyber world. Do you feel like a second ago we said we were going to come back to social? Do you feel like that is a nice bow around the thing that you wanted to say, or was there something else you wanted to say about it? I would say for sure I don't know what the right answer is with social media. Yeah. I mean, I know that I am a 41-year-old grown-ass woman who has been doing this for 11 years, and I still put something out, and I'm like, oh my god, do people like it? Like. How many likes was that? Like, not is that? It, yeah. Did that I offend is, anyone? Did I please anyone? Yeah. And that can't be a healthy way to yeah. live, right? I yeah. know this. I think there's a lot of math, a lot of studies. We wish we had Brene here to validate. She would tell us. <laughs> she she would tell all us, the things. I know. <laughs> uh, about you know the the role that that's playing on our psychology, mm -hmm. and I think she she, ta she talks about it in her most recent book, The Belonging. It's like the the rise of X, but the decline of Y, and like mm -hmm. the rise of participation in social, and the increasing feelings of, uh, or decreasing feelings of connection. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, a couple of the things. So I, I, I'm sensitive about our time here, but we, we, I wanted to say, is there anything else you wanted to talk about the nonprofit? Like, what's you know, give some people some coordinates on where they can go to participate in that mm -hmm. community. Yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> togetherrising.org is the name of our website. Um, the cool thing about Together Rising is that we all, everybody who runs Together Rising is a volunteer. So 100% <clears throat> of every penny, you know, every penny that's given to Together Rising goes directly to people in need. <clears throat> so um, if you're going to give, it's a good place to give. Um, I think that, I think it feels good right now to be a part of a community that's responding all the time, mm -hmm. just because it feels like, I don't know if more bad stuff is happening right now, but it feels like it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think the cool thing about Together Rising, what we learned actually with the refugee crisis when we were figuring out who to partner with on the ground yeah. um, internationally was that the big groups, I mean, the, the big, the UN asked us to like partner with them and, and, and we tried and, and it, the big groups that have all the red tape are, they're done, yeah. Yeah. dead to me. It's like hard. the world is moving too fast to get things approved on 40 levels. Like we're, we're, we're six crises away yeah. from the thing we just asked you about. And, yeah. and the, the people in the camps are telling us, no, 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 not the big organizations, the little um, life, like people who are on the ground who are able to respond fast. So, th so those are the people we ended up partnering with. Cool. Um, help refugees and the white helmets and these people who are just like in it. And that's what we do. We're like fast and, um, you know, often all day, all yeah. day I get emails from my board like approve or don't approve. And there's a vetting team, but it's, they need this money now. Now, now, now. Yeah. So, you know, the, the Mr. Rogers thing quote that everybody says, like, that you're going to see a lot of bad stuff and it's gonna hurt you, but there will always be helpers rushing to the scene. So look for the helpers, be the helpers. This, being a part of this crew, to me feels like I'm always, we can't control what happens, but we can always control whether or not we're gonna to respond to it. Yeah. Um, so it makes me feel like I'm always part of, on the good team, you know, like rushing in yeah. each time. Um, so yeah, that's it. Leadership. Mm. You've become an um, either intentionally and actively or accidentally mm -hmm. leader of a movement of strong women figuring a lot of things out and taking massive action. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any words on leadership? How do you think about it? Do you not see yourself as a leader? Do you see yourself as a leader? No, I do see myself as a leader. <clears throat> um, I think that for me right now, I think if your definition of leadership is not evolving based on exactly where you are and who you're with in the moment, then, then it's probably not as alive as it should be. But I think that um, I like the idea of being who you needed when you were younger. So um, what I think about in terms of leadership is kind of how I feel about writing. You know, you, you write the book that you wish you could find. Like it doesn't exist yet and yeah. you need it. Yeah. Which is so funny because most people think that you write the book about the thing you know the most about, yeah. which is never what I do. I mean, I wrote yeah. an entire book about <laughs> sex and love and I didn't even know I was gay. Okay, so it's like, <laughs> you write the book you desperately need, right? Yeah. And I think you become the leader that you desperately wish existed, right? So I wanted, I mean, I looked at, and I think right now we look at, um, 
it feels like there's so much leadership that's based on this kind of power that's divisive and top um, down. And top down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and, not right. And, it, and it's fake. Yeah. It's, it's like shiny. It's, and, and it doesn't yeah. even matter that yeah. it's fake anymore. Yeah. We used to at least pretend that we yeah. believed it. It doesn't even matter if it's yeah. if we know it's fake. Everybody knows it's fake. Um, there's no truth in it. There's no beauty in it. Um, it's like kind of dog eat dog, and it's you get to the top no matter what. And I think there's this other kind of leader that's rising, and I think it does have to do with. And I, you said the rising of feminine energy. And I don't know. Before. Again, this is like I'm just trying to put it out there. I don't. My vocabulary is not going to be the right vocabulary. Same. But I'm trying to figure out yeah. the vocabulary for it too. Great. That's one of my favorite things. Like we live in the questions. We don't know what the answers are yet. Yeah. Um, and I and I see all these T-shirts. I think people think of me as a feminist, and I am a feminist, and I see all these t-shirts that say the future is female, and it doesn't ring exactly true to me. I think what the future is, is the future is inside of qualities that have typically been um, associated with femininity, mm -hmm. so they are devalued in women and shamed out of men. I absolutely feel that about myself. I was, you know, Raised to be tough and X and Y, and not 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 told to be soft, mm -hmm. but there was the because I was um, crowding out. I was trying to fill myself up on one side. I was crowding out the other for sure. Of course. Um, I think that's really really insightful what you just said. I think like maybe that's a better way of describing the future. Because it's in everybody. Yeah. Right. It's this this um, idea of collaboration and listening to each other instead of just nah, 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 nah. Right. right and being curious instead of defensive yeah. and um, ha having gathering. some tenderness yeah. gathering like yeah. these are um, in every single last one of us and the thing is they are not feminine yeah. or masculine yeah. the Human. femininity and masculinity are just utter horseshit yeah. right they're just um, ideas that keep actual men and actual women from really being fully human with each other. Beautiful. Right? So I do not think that the way to resist um, patriarchy is to demand matriarchy. Like, it's... False dichotomy. It's yeah. Completely. Yeah. Like, that is not beautiful enough and it's not true enough. And any time there's any plan that does not include equally everyone, that plan is just not, it's not going to last. It's not true. Because there's just always a third way, right? It's like, it's very, that's very basic and primal and not evolved. Like, when we see something that's not true, it's like fight or flight, right? Yeah. This or that. And there's always a third way. Yeah. Right? So the third way is to create something that's beautiful and more inclusive and resists black and white and is always, um, uh, and both, and it excludes nobody, right? Any story that we tell that excludes anybody is, it, it's not true. It, it's just not true enough. Like, that's how you know. That's how you know that that one's not beautiful enough. Brilliant. Right? So, um, I don't know, I, I, find, I, I think that um, there is an answer to what's next and it has to do with um, allowing, not having gender be any sort of, yeah. of barrier or issue. You know, just allowing these qualities that we need to, um, to move forward together as one and, and create healing, yes. arise in men and women and everything beyond and in between. Um, because, you know, I, th I think one of the things I learned in Love Warrior is that when we cut men off from their emotions, which we do so early, right? You know, Super brave, early. you know, strong boys don't cry, strong boys aren't, aren't vulnerable, strong boys don't feel, then they're broken. Because there's a third of the body, minds, there's a third broken. They're broken people. And then we cut women off from their bodies because our bodies are so commodified and objectified. We just we vote them off the island. And then we're broken. Right? And we're all just... So I think that what the next generation of leaders is going to do is make sure that every single person at a table is allowed to bring their whole human self. You know, that women are allowed to be strong and opinionated um, without being shamed for it, and men are allowed to be tender and collaborative and vulnerable. That is going to be where when all the magic happens. You mentioned bravery. So this may be my last, like, sort of this is in, in a little speed run here. Um, bravery. Any any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that I don't know. I think of of an integrity. 
more than bravery. I think that integrity and courage means to me, it used to mean to me trying to match this idea of what people thought was good. It's a tough one now, though. <laughs> because I just figured out that's the wrong question. Okay. What's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong? The pro I learned this when I was trying to get through my marriage thing. Like Everybody told me what was right, what was wrong. The problem was that the people in the church thought what was right was this, and the people who were the feminists thought something right was this. It was all, the problem with right and wrong is that they're not sole concepts. They're cu culturally constructed. Yep. Right? They're, they're external. Yeah. They're external. They're different in every family, in every culture, in every... So, so in a patriarchal system, what's right and wrong, like the most perfect woman is the most perfect patriarchal pawn. Right? Like, yeah. in a patriarchy, you can either live well um, or you can, like, follow the rules, but you can't do both, right? So what I figured out is that instead of asking myself what is right or wrong or good or bad, that I needed to ask myself what is true and what is beautiful, right? That those are words that my soul understands. I always know that. Yeah. Right or wrong feels like I'm asking everybody else in the world what to do, and what is true and beautiful feels very creative and individual to me. Um, so I think that bravery for me is doing the next true and beautiful, the, doing the next thing that is the truest and the most beautiful. Whether that's, and not pretending like I don't have an idea for that. Right? We can all imagine it, and most of us, we can imagine the most beautiful family the truest, we can imagine the most beautiful life, we can imagine the most beautiful country, we can imagine, the, but we just think that's like a pipe dream. I think, I think well, that we can imagine it because it's the plan. That's where we're heading. That's yeah, we where have, we're heading. Yeah. So like we imagine it and then we just create it. Right, so no matter what anybody says about, oh that's a pipe dream or that's Pollyanna or whatever, um, I think that everybody who revolutionized her own life or family or country is somebody who actually believed in her, what she could imagine. And like, just was like, well, if I can imagine it in here, then I'm going to make it out here. Thank you so much. Mm, I, I'm, it's I... been so, uh, it's brought me so much joy to be able to hang with you today. Thank you so much for coming by here. Abby, thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. <laughs> um, she's like, okay, you said it's going to be an hour. She just loves she's listening so... to her wife talk for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard any of this. It's all, it's all for the first time. So I'm off, off camera hungry. We got to go. We got... Food was one of our core things it's we were taking care of. That's right, that's right. Um, thanks for tuning in, guys. Probably see you tomorrow or the next day. Or